Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 22nd, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we use IRS data to analyze which segments of Alaska's working age population are leaving the state. Second, we discuss what's missing from DNR's presentation last week on oil production volumes. And third, we quickly address concerns we have about where the K-12 funding bill stands now and the currently proposed PFD fix. And now, let's join Michael. I guess we'll get things started and get uh, just kick things off. We're going to start off today. There's been a lot of talk about the outflow and migration, uh, inflow and outflow of migration of uh, workers from Alaska. But the big part is the age groups. And uh, you wanted to start off with that. So let's uh, let's get down into the weeds and uh, and get started on that. We've had uh, we've had something of a game of, uh, of telephone. You remember the old child's game of telephone? Oh, yeah. I I tell you something, you tell it to the next person. By the time it gets to the last person, it's something entirely different from, from where it started. Well, we've, we're having something of a game of telephone um, here uh, in Alaska over uh, over what's going on with our population, and it's it's interesting and it's important. I mean, uh, we'll it it, but but it's not it it's not well it's not well understood what's going on. This this thing started when the Department of Labor uh, last week published a report, the headline of which was Alaska population remains similar in size from 2022 to 23. And in the middle of that, in the middle of the, of the uh, piece they released, uh, that was the, that was the press release they released, it says this, despite, despite the slight overall growth in population, Alaska continued to lose people to migration. Net migration in migrants minus out migrants resulted in a net outflow of 3,246 people. Alaska has lost more movers than it has gained every year since 2013, but losses have slowed in recent years. Alaska's 65 and older population grew 3%, and the 18 to 64 year old group, what's now being referred to as the as the working age group declined by 0.2%, declined by 0.2%. So that's where this game of telephone started. The next, the, the, the next step uh, was an article that Alex DeMarvin wrote uh, in the Anchorage Daily News headline, Alaska's working age population continues its long decline, a headwind for the economy. Now keep in mind that in the original report, they said, Alaska's 65 and older population grew 3%, and the 18 to 64-year-old population declined by 0.2%. And now we've got that translated into Alaska's working age population, the 18 to 64 group, continues its long decline, a headwind for the economy. And Alex does a good job going into sort of the history of this going back to 2013 when this decline started. Um, and and really sort of steps through what's going on with uh, with respect to the population. But remember, this started with a with a press release that says the decline has been zero point two percent. Then the next step is what's going on in the legislature with all this. 
And James Brooks wrote an article in the um, in the Beacon that's been picked up by the ADN and others. Alaska's work, working population loss casts long shadow over legislative session. And James does a, a great job talking about, you know, how everybody is using what began as a 0.2% decline in the population. James uh, 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 does a good job describing what everybody's doing with this. And basically what people are doing is saying, hey, we got a decline in working age population. That's horrible. My issue is the one that's causing it. Right. And, and he goes through, he goes through a list, George Rauscher, uh, and a member of the uh, a member of the House Majority Co- Coalition suggested that high electricity prices are contributing to the high cost of living driving people out uh, of Alaska. Senator Pre- Senate President Gary Stevens said increased education funding uh, is necessary in order to keep people um, uh, in the state. Um, and then um, G- uh, Kathy Giesel said the lack of a pension program. For state employees is deterring people from moving to the state to take state jobs. And the revival of the pension is the majority's uh, number two priority. So we've got all these people who are who are now taking this 0.2% population decline and blowing it up into, hey, the real reason for it is my issue and the state needs to fund my issue more in George Rouser's, George Rouser's case by spending more on in state energy, in uh, uh, Gary Stevens' case, spending more on K through 12, and Kathy Giesel's case, spending more on the defined pension program. Everybody, everybody is using this issue as a reason for for more more and more spending. You, you notice the one thing that I didn't see in any of that. I didn't see anything about overall government spending being part of the problem driving people out. I mean, I just I'm throwing that out there. I'm just throwing that out there. Well, interesting you mentioned that. <laughs> it's like we have this set up. Interesting you mentioned that. Uh, so I got interested in who exactly are these people? Who, who is the working age population? Uh, which part of the working age population is, is leaving the state? And, and you can't do it from, Department of Labor, from the Alaska Department of Labor Statistics. They don't keep an, an income by income bracket breakdown. Uh, because we don't have that information in the state, basically. They don't keep a by, imp- by, by income bracket breakdown of what's going on with the population. But the IRS does. Since 2015, the IRS has published state data. Well, they published state data for a long time. But in 2015, they started including information that breaks down the number of filings, the number of returns filed by income bracket, by age. And they did this by, they do it by including a category that says filings by the elderly. Now they classify elderly as 60 and above. And I'm, and I, you know, I sort of take it, take, take offense at that. So, but I, so I had to spend about 10 minutes getting over that, but, but, but you can go into the, you can go into the IRS data and, and, and separate the, the income brackets, what's going on with the income brackets over the years by age, dividing it into the elderly and the non-elderly, those filing income taxes, uh, uh, income tax returns that are less than 60, 60 years old. And that data is really interesting. Um, if you've got that chart, let's, th- let's throw it up. Let's throw it up now so I can, uh, I can talk to it. So I've done a chart that breaks down the, the change in population from 2015 to 2020, the change in returns from 2015 to 2020 by income bracket, by age. I've used the, I've used the, the, the IRS data to focus on the, what, what they classify as the working families or the, the, the working age families, which are 60 and below. And, and there's something very interesting going on. You'll see on the data, the, the, the bars in red are where there's a decline. The bars in blue are where there's an increase. And the gray bars are just summary bars of, of the various bars up until uh, up to where the, where the gray bar appears. But you can see that, the decli- that, that from 2015 to 2020, 
the number of households, working age households, non-elderly working age households, the number of households, number of returns have declined for every group up to the $200,000 mark. So, and, and, and it increases the farther, the farther down the income bracket you go from a hundred thousand to 200,000, the decline has been 1.7% from, uh, using using one of the summaries from 75,000 to or from 25,000 to 100,000 the decline has been 3.8% below 25,000 the decline has been 15%. Those brackets have those income brackets have declined as as for over time from 2015 to 2018. Those with populations working age families with incomes of $200,000 and above have increased. The the those with income between uh, a hundred thousand or or a hundred thousand or more, hundred thousand to the highest income, have increased by two point three percent. Those with incomes of two hundred thousand or more have increased by eighteen point five percent. The the interesting thing about this overlay about about this chart is when you overlay it with the burden that's imposed, the regressivity. Of, of what we're using for a fiscal system, relying on PFD cuts. When you overlay that on top of this chart, you see that the people leaving the state, the income groups leaving the state, state are those that are being burdened greatest by PFD cuts. Those that have the largest share of their income being taken by the fiscal system the state's using, PFD cuts. Those that are not only staying but growing are those income groups that aren't be aren't being affected by Alaska's fiscal system. The PFD PFD cuts take a trivial share of of, of in income brackets above hundred thousand or well above two hundred thousand dollars and above. So those income groups, those that aren't being affected by Alaska's fiscal system, those that aren't being taxed by Alaska's fiscal system, are growing. Those that are being taxed increasingly heavily by Alaska's fiscal system through PFD cuts are declining. And it follows the, the chart. This chart follows right down the, 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 the course of the regressivity. Regressivity hits middle income, fa- uh, middle income Alaska families harder than upper income Alaska families. They're showing a moderate decline. Middle income families are. It hits lower income families hardest of all, harder than 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 any other uh, 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 group of Alaska families, and they're showing the greatest decline. So, when you if you really want to get into this, you need to look at where which which families are leaving, which of the working age families are leaving, and it's not those in the top twenty percent. It's not those in the upper income. They're staying. They're growing. In fact. It is it is a it is families in middle and lower income working working age families in middle and low in the middle and lower income brackets that are leaving. So when you when you average these two together, you get a decline overall decline from 2015 to 2020 of 4.8 percent, roughly five percent. Right. But but the huge share of the decline is in the middle and lower income Alaska bracket. So if you want to talk about if you want to talk about what's the cause of people leaving the state, it's it's that we're taxing them. We're taxing middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for government. We're taxing middle and lower income Alaska families. And the irony of this, the irony of this is all of the solutions that 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 various other people are talking about. George Rauscher's increased energy uh, investment in energy. Gary Stevens increased investment in K through 12. Kathy Giesel's increased investment in, in defined benefits. All of those will increase PFD cuts, increase the burden, and drive even more of those families out of the state. Where like, their <clears throat> solutions are going to make the are market are going to make the issue the, the problem worse. Yeah, like uh, like I said, government spending may be the problem. Let me summate this ch- this chart for folks who are listening on the radio. Essentially, uh, there's been a 15 15- Point two, or well, actually 18, 19% decrease in tax returns of people who are making under $100,000 a year. And there's been a 20 plus 20.3% increase in tax returns of people making over $100,000 a year. So more rich people are staying, more of the people who are not paying 
or not paying their full percentile are are staying and those who are under the burden of this tax under a hundred thousand dollars are leaving 20 percent leaving 20 percent staying and that's where it's going it's um this is an interesting chart for to say the least quickly brad here i got like less than 60 seconds to give me a summation before we move to the break well it, it, if if the if the Alaska legislature thinks the solution to this to the to the loss of the working age problem is increased government spending, they're going the wrong direction. The solution is to look at what at where at where the burden of the existing fiscal system is hitting Alaska families, and to correct that, not to not yeah. to increase government spending. This is a fascinating snapshot of. Uh, I mean, this is obviously not exhaustive, but it gives you a good snapshot of of what's happening in the state. I mean, this is, again, he said they an 11 year downward trend is what they're saying. But when you look at this, you realize uh, either more people in Alaska are making higher amounts of money or overall you're seeing where the majority of the exodus is coming from as far as dollars. Well, it shows that there's an exodus, Michael. We're down the, the returns, file returns over the five year period from 2015 to 2020 are down 4.4.8 percent. I think that number is. So we're we're showing we're showing an exodus. We're showing less returns in the state. And there's another chart that I did in last week's landmine that shows we're we're down people also because the IRS also gives you the data of individuals, not broken by age, but individuals across the income brackets. Um, and we're down we're down people. So we're we're bleeding people. I. There, there's the 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 Department of Labor is exactly right with this. This this doesn't doesn't contradict that at all. We're bleeding people, but we're bleeding people from middle from the middle and lower income brackets. The upper income brackets are doing just fine. In fact, they're growing. It's not just that they're holding their own; they're growing uh, uh, over the last over the last five years. Returns in the upper income brackets are growing. It's middle and lower income Alaska families that. Uh, that we're, that we're bleeding out. So we, we ought to, I mean, if the legislature is really going to get into this, if everybody's going to say, okay, the, the, the template or the, the touchstone this time is what does it do to our work, to, to the loss of working age? We need to recognize, the legislature needs to recognize that, that the loss that we're occurring is occurring in middle and lower income brackets. And anything they do, anything they do, needs to be focused on the middle and lower income brackets. And everything they've done since 2016, since 2017, when the legislature got into the act of cutting PFDs, everything they've done is to shove the fiscal burden of the state's deficits off on those that very same group, off on middle and lower income Alaska families. So if you, if George Rauscher, you think, or Gary Stevens or Kathy Giesel, you think, the solution to this is, oh, government's going to come in and government's going to increase spending and we're going to solve this. If you increase that spending by increasing PFD cuts, which is what you've done the last the last you know eight years, if you if you think you're going to do this by increasing PFD cuts and you're going to solve the problem, you're actually going to make the problem worse. And and that's something that that I don't think the legislature has any clue about. I mean, they think government solves all. And really, yeah. all I Republicans, Democrats alike, government solves all, and all I need to do is just spend more money someplace. But it's where you're getting the money that's having the impact. It's interesting that these are, numbers are almost even nineteen nineteen uh, percent drop uh, in the lower incomes and a twenty point seven percent increase in the upper incomes. It's it's interesting how they're so close. Uh, Brian says correlation is not causation, Brad. It may suggest that this is a reason. Right here is what he says. Yeah, well, I, um, I, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty damn big reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would, I would say that that definitely uh, shows some of the stuff for sure uh, that uh, makes you uh, ask some questions there for sure. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, continues with us right now. The weekly top three. We're going to move on to number two. Although we probably could spend a couple segments on number one this morning for sure. It was a it was a lot, and I think we basically just got the thumbnail sketch of that one right there. Let's move on to discussions about the DNR presentations. What's missing from the presentation is the big question, Brad. Let's start there. So DNR uh, at the beginning of the of the session, 
the finance committees always have various agencies in to talk about uh, uh, what's going on in various pieces of the state. DNR, Department of Natural Resources, comes in to talk about oil production because oil production historically is important and still is important in terms of oil revenues. Let me try it this way. Oil revenues are still are have always been important and are still important in terms of the state in, in terms of the state budget outlook. So DNR came in, made their presentation, and and as as you would expect them to do, talked about this huge increase in, in production. They see overall state production. They see toward the middle and the end of the ten year forecast period uh, that the that the that the state looks at. They there there's a ramp up that occurs from Pika. Uh, in the in sort of the middle of the period, middle to the to the first part of the latter part of the period, and then willow starts showing up. Volumes from willow start showing up at the latter period, and DNR made a big deal about about how you know this is all great and and production's going up, and you don't need to worry uh, that 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 you know we're going to be saved here by by production out there out there in the future. And the and the the legislature picked this up, the the finance committee picked it up, and the press picked it up, and everybody said, oh, we're we're, we're going to be saved. How to, yeah, we got a few years, a rough patch ahead of us, uh, but we're going to be saved uh, by the end of it. Here's here's what they here's what everybody's missing. And I we did a column on this in the landmine a couple of weeks ago. Yes, revenues are going up dramatically over the ten year period. We're about four at four seventy now, four hundred seventy thousand barrels a day now. At the end of the period, by the end of the period in, in, in fiscal year thirty three. DNR projects will be at 633,000 barrels, an increase of roughly, you know, 50% uh, over the over the period. Big, big increase in production. But revenues, the revenues from those volumes are going down. Not only are they not going up as much, they're going down over the 10-year period. We start the 10-year period with oil revenues at $2.41 billion dollars. That's DNR's projection or DOR's projection of revenues at the beginning of the period. At the end of the period, we're at $2.1 billion, $300 million less in terms of revenues from that oil than, than, than we were at the beginning of the period. So you've got volumes going up, big story, and you've got revenues going down. My problem was, my problem is DNR makes this big pitch during their presentation about Oh, we finally got volumes on the right track. We're going the right direction. Don't touch oil taxes. I mean, they're the key to all this. That's why, you know, that's what everybody says. It's it's why we're having this big, this big, this big production boost. Revenues are going down from the from the state revenues are going down. from the standpoint of the state. Honestly, I don't care much about where production volumes are going. It's nice to have them going up. It's nice to say that Alaska is producing more widgets. Uh, than it used to, but what's the meaning to the state? And remember, these are state volumes; they're out, they're on state lands. What's the meaning to the state? What's the value to the state from that increased production? And the answer is the volumes are going down, <laughs> or the re the revenues are going down. That's the story. The story ought to be: Hey, we're getting these big increase in, in production volumes, but we're not getting any revenues. In fact, we're losing revenues. Out of out of these big increase in production volumes, what's what's the store? What what's going on there? And shouldn't we be doing something about it so that the state receives some sort of similar benefit from oil from oil volumes going up in terms of in terms of revenues going up? Now, the state would say, DNR would say, oh well, you know what, what's really going on out there at the end of the period is is the impact of all the investments made in Willow and those flowing in Pika, and those flowing through the way we calculate oil taxes, and it'll all be better. We'll finally get some increase in revenues out there in the 2030s someplace. It'll all catch up out there in the 2030s someplace. Well, yeah, but we got to survive the 2020s <laughs> before we ever get to the 2030s, right. and frankly, I'm not sure that happens. I mean, I've looked at the DNR analysis on Alpine. I've looked or on Willow, rather. I've looked at what's go, at the trends that are going on in the ten-year period, in terms of the projection period, and I'm not sure that happens out there in the 2030s. I mean, it's a nice story, and you can say it because you don't have any numbers that contradict it, because your window ends at 2033. But I don't think it happens, 
And 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 so we we've got we've got all this press and all of these people saying, yeah, we've done it. We got production up. Well, folks, <laughs> we've got it up at the expense of revenues. And the real story from the standpoint of the state needs to be revenues, not just producing more widgets. So what should we be doing? Should we be talking about the oil taxes? Should we be looking at it and saying these <clears throat> this was too much? We've given away the farm in the short term for some long term or potential long term gain. Should we be looking at uh, I mean, should we be looking at the tax schedules for these kind of things? Absolutely. Absolutely. I wrote a column. We wrote a column in the landmine a few weeks ago that said, you know, the state's leaving money on the table in terms of oil taxes. Oil taxes to, to get investment re restarted. I mean, we were we were at the tail end of investment. We were we were the we were lagging the industry by a lot in the in the late 20, 2000s and the early 20 teens. To get oil investment restarted, we needed to come in and we needed to reform the oil tax system. It was it was pushing investment away from Alaska. We did that, but you know you don't do everything perfectly. When, when you do it and you need to keep track of what's going on with the results of what you've done at the time you did it. And what's happened is there are some things that got happened that, 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 that some, some consequences of what was done with oil taxes that need to be changed in order for the state to get the revenues. Remember the important part to the state of production volumes is revenues, not just more widgets, but revenues. On a we, finite need do, we need to do some things finite. to get, like, get more revenues. On a finite resource, right? I mean, this is not a renewable. This is something that's finite. We need to make sure that we get maximum yield uh, and maximum dollars out of those while still not, it's a balance, obviously. You want to keep the investment up, but you are you have a finite resource. We need to be getting the maximum we can out of the taxation. And if it's showing that we're losing money in the long run or receiving more, receiving less for more volume, that's a problem. It is a problem. And, and that's where the legislature needs to focus. They don't need to be declaring victory. Oh, volumes are up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we did it right. Next, next subject. You know, how, how do we spend more? <laughs> it, it, they, they need to be focusing on the revenue side. And the, the administration needs to be focusing on the revenue side. I mean, DNR came in and sort of took a victory lap, right? Production volumes are up. We did it right. Don't mess with, don't mess with what we did. Wrong. Production volumes are up. Revenues are going down. We do need to be looking at what's at what's going on, and we need to be, you know, talking about the changes. As you say, there's a balance, but we need to be talking about changes that make sure the state benefits from the increase in 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 revenues in some fashion. Not out there, you know, 20, 15 years from now, but but currently, um, in some fashion. So it's we've taken the wrong message. The state is taking the wrong message. And the, and the and the and the press has taken the wrong message out of the DNR presentation. The pre, the, the the message ought to be production's up. That's good. Revenues are down. What's going on, and and what should we be doing in order to make sure that Alaskans get their fair share of the revenues that are being generated by the industry by these increased volumes? Okay, we make Brad Keithley king for a day. He can decide anything. What is your solution to this? What do you, I mean, you know, is it a, what taxation change do you make here uh, on the producers or on the oil company? What, what, what changes have to be made in your mind? I don't have to get real creative. The administration prior to Adam Crum, the administration had already focused on this. And the administration under, under DOR before Adam Crum came in and shut it down, DOR had already focused on, you know, reductions in per barrel credits, which does some of this um, uh, 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 closing the Hillcorp loophole. That's about a hundred million dollars. That's the difference between what Hillcorp pays in taxes and what BP paid in taxes for the very same uh, fields that uh, that Hillcorp uh, bought from BP. Closing the Hillcorp loophole, we probably need to look at the way that we allow for. Uh, deductions, uh, uh, expenses, or investment, not not exclude the the investment from from deductions, but how we do it, how we time it, and we probably need to look at what's called the the gross revenue val or gross GVR gross value revenue uh, reduction that we allow for new volumes. We probably ought to look at that again. We already looked at it once in the middle twenties and made some adjustments to it. We probably ought to look twenty teens. We ought to probably ought to look at it again uh, and make some more adjustments to it. 
uh, <clears throat> this is, I mean, and this is what we've been talking about, part of this balanced approach to cutting the government spending, protecting the PFD, putting a spending cap in, new taxes for oil, uh, because we are leaving money on the table, which, I mean, some people in the, especially those in the more conservative side, don't want to hear at all. Uh, but again, a finite resource that we're letting out the door for pennies on the dollar. Uh, and in the long run, the, you know, if we can't survive between now and then, it doesn't matter what a good deal we get 20 years from now. Yeah, it's, I mean, here's the problem with oil taxes. Whenever you get into oil taxes, you have people that say, oh, we ought to go back to ACES or we ought to, we ought to do this, or we ought to eliminate the per bill credits, or we ought to do, no, I mean, that just sends us back to the early 20 teens. That, that will send us back to the bottom of the heap in terms of, in terms of attracting investment. There is a balance. We made the balance in, in 2013. We made the balance at the time. It has produced results, but we need to rebalance it. It's not, I mean, the industry says, well, you know, don't, don't disturb it. Well, it's been 10 years. I mean, the industry wanted it disturbed in 2013 because it wasn't working then. They were all for disturbing it. It's not working now. It's not working the way it should for the state's interest in terms of revenues now. And we ought to look at it again. But let's not go hog wild. I mean, the problem with with Robin Brennan's proposal, what was it? No on two or what, whatever the whatever the the, the initiative was. Uh, the problem is it went, went way too far. So you're 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 going here. We are now here. We're way over here. That's how much the industry ought to be, you know, giving to the state. No, that sends us back to the early 20 teens. Let's find a way in the middle. But we ought to be looking for the place in the middle, and 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 having presentations by DNR and the press being oh, all all's rosy because production's going up. That's not the issue. The issue is revenue. The revenue is going down. We ought to be looking at ways to, to ways to fix that. Balance it and fix it. Rob Meyer says, funny how oil production and prices are the first thing in the agenda for finance, but not the rest of the economy. Again, this goes right back to that whole idea of that divorcing of as long as the public economy is doing great, we're all doing great. We're all doing great. Um, lose a little here, lose a little there, but we make up for it on volume. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's some classic stuff right there. That is uh, that is for sure. Um, <clears throat> just going through, we need to drill, baby, drill. Well, the and 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 I think is part of it is uh, uh, part of it is you know we could drill more all we want, but if we receive less revenue for more re production, still, I mean, that's a declining. You know, I mean, you could only make up for it in volume for so many times. And we're still, you know, we're still if we're paying out for credits and other things. I mean, the whole thing needs to be reevaluated at some point. Right. Yeah, exactly right. Drill baby drill is actually costing us money. I mean, the, because of the way the credits work, because of the way the deductions work, because of the of the benefits of GVR, because of the way the production volume credits work, uh, drilling is actually costing us money. Uh, we know that from Willow. I mean, DNR, DOR has done the analysis that says we're losing money in the first few years from Willow. Um, and that's what they want to tell us. We're losing money in the first few years, but we'll make it up on the back end. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, the back end is now way the heck beyond the, the beyond the 10 year period. So, so I'm not sure we're making it up. I know we're losing it in the front end and I know we're losing a lot in the front end from both Pika and from, uh, Willow, I'm not sure we make it up in the back end, and um, and and so that's you know when drill baby drill is as and to go back to Brian's comment when you you know lose a little here and you lose a little there, but you're going to make it up in volume. No, you aren't. You're going to keep on losing. So that's that's what we need to evaluate. Right, and and on top of that, Willow is on federal land, right? So we're not getting uh, the same amounts for that. So that's diminishing returns just almost right out of the gate. Peak is the one that we can uh, we can expect to see some some benefit from in the long run. But you know, yeah, we're that's exactly right, Brian. We're taking it in the back end. Yes, we are taking it in the back end. That's that's exactly what we're uh, what we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> Well, Brad, uh, I did want to run something by you real quick. How much time do I got? I got enough time here. Uh, I don't know if you saw the comment in Must Read Alaska on Scott Kawasaki's dream, um, but Scott Kawasaki had a dream. He had a dream back in 2000 and whatever it was, 2008, 
when uh, when uh, Sarah Palin was net was tapped for vice president. He dreamed that before it happened. And he said just the other night he had a dream that Mike Dunleavy was going to be tapped for vice president, uh, which, again, uh, whether it's vice president or uh, uh, or commissioner or the Department of the Interior director or whatever cabinet level stuff. Is this explain a lot of Mike Dunleavy's kind of quiet um, um, hiding, I guess, in the administration right now? What do you what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think I, I don't think it's vice president. I mean, I Sarah Palin is or DNR. I mean, or or Department of the Interior. Right. Right I, I I think I think Dunleavy's clearly angling for Department of Interior. I think he's really. I mean, where does he go after this? Uh, he's really not developing himself into a strong candidate against Lisa. I mean, he may think he is, but he's not uh, because he's just sort of a, he's sort of a do nothing governor. So where does he go uh, after he finishes, you know, his, his second term? Um, and, you know, I, 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 going to DC is always an attraction for people and, you know, running department of interior, you know, the Wally Hickel uh, uh, legacy and, and all that. Um, I think that's clearly what, what he has in mind. So, yeah, I, I think it explains a lot. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be known as a tax governor. Every time he surfaces taxes, like last year when he surfaced sales tax, you know, I can just sort of visualize, he goes back into the office and there are people beating on him saying, oh no, 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 you don't want to be, a, you don't want to do that because, you know, Trump would, you know, Trump wouldn't pick you then because you'd, you'd be tainted goods. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. Um, and so, and so he doesn't do that. I mean, he mentions it. He sort of, you know, the, the good Mike Dunleavy shows up and, and, and says something about equitable revenues. And then, you know, after the beatings, talk about beatings, after the beatings, when he gets back to the office, he doesn't talk about that anymore because he doesn't want to, you know, uh, 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 cause cause reputational damage uh, right to, right to his prospects right. as as interior secretary so yeah i think that's clearly motivating yeah well i put the kibosh on the whole idea that he was going to be vice president because he's taller than trump and you could never have that ever he could never that he would never stand for that so it's uh it's an interesting uh interesting point all right we're back brad keithley is our guest uh final segment of the weekly top three Today, he's got, uh, I've got some explaining to do. We got some questions, a couple of concerns on the K through 12 bill and on the PFD constitutional amendment. Uh, Brad, let's, uh, let's, let's get to it. Well, I didn't, I didn't want to do full segments on these because full segments tend, I tend to bash things and I didn't, and I don't really want to bash these, but I, I do want to surface what I think are issues about these K through 12. K through 12 to me is numbers. Uh, last year, the legislature passed an increase, the one-time increase for K through 12, which was $174 million. The governor vetoed it down to $87 million. Well, now, now with the with the what's going on with K through 12 now in, in the in the House Rules Committee, I mean, I think the perceptions out there is that the House Rules Committee is holding the line. They've decreased, they're de they're decreasing the 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 grab. That the that the K through twelve industry is trying to make for additional monies, and um, and 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 they're doing really good things. He, here's the numbers. Keep in mind that last year the legislature passed the one time increase the legislature passed was 174 million dollars. The the total of what's now in the in what came out of House rules, the total increased spending that came out of House rules, is about 210 million dollars. $30 million more, $40 million more than was than the than the legislature passed last year. And remember that the governor vetoed the $174 million down to $87 million. And so it, compared to those numbers, the what's coming out of House Rules is $210 million. Now, $20 million of that is for uh is for broadband. So take yeah. that off uh and, and don't include that in the calculation for K through 12. That's still $190 million, $16 million more than the legislature passed last year for the one time before the, before the governor vetoed it. What's going on is not so much that, that the Rules Committee decreased spending. They decreased it on, on the BSA, the portion that goes to the BSA, but they've increased it a bunch of other places that, in, that, that, that produces a package that costs more than what the one-time increase that the legislature passed uh, last legislature was. My concern is this. Okay, so let's say let's say the right place to draw the line is 190 million dollars. Well, we're not 
we're far from through dealing with the BSA, right? People are going to press on increasing the BSA. So we've got it. We've got a package that the governor has that that the rules committee has tilted to increase spending elsewhere. To pay for that, they've essentially decreased BSA. If people push to increase the BSA, what's what's going to happen on the other side? The stuff that the governor wanted to spend. If you look at Congress, what they do is they spend on both. I mean, their their vision of com of compromises. Right. Let's just keep spending on everything. And and my concern is that K through twelve is, is going to rapidly get out of control here, uh, as people make proposals for BSA. If you're going to, if you're going to increase the BSA, you got to decrease, decrease it elsewhere or else you're going to end up with a $500 million, a half billion dollar, uh, K through 12 bill. That's my concern on K through 12. The second, uh, before, before you get into the second, let yeah. me comment because in having some conversations with some of the folks, and I think, uh, Shelly Hughes mentioned it yesterday and everything else, what they're trying to do is spend the amount it, 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 you know, uh, close to the amount to what people were looking for in the BSA, but instead of putting it into the BSA where it ends up in administrative and classroom and everything else, they said that they're trying to make it more programmatic so that that money ends up in the classroom and has some accountability. That's their argument. What do you say to that? Well, I, I, I get that. I mean, they're still spending more than, than what the legislature passed last year to increase the BSA on a one-time basis. They're still spending more, but I, I get what they're doing. But the, but the problem is it's not, the, the K through 12 industry is far from finished push, pushing back. Public K through 12 industry is far from from finished pushing back and wanting an increase to the BSA. The Senate certainly is going to push for an increase to the BSA. So as it goes through the process, if there is if there is consensus to increase the BSA, either the governor is going to have to cut back on what he's trying to do with the other stuff, or we're going to end up, as I say, with a five hundred million dollar, a half a billion dollar packaged by we're, by the time we're finished between what's the gut what the governor wants to prioritize and what happens on the BSA side okay all right I just wanted to throw that out there as kind of a devil's advocacy thing because that's what I'm hearing from folks uh, and that's kind of what Shelley Hughes said yesterday the bottom line is the question the big question always remains is who pays for all this stuff where regardless <laughs> of where it goes and who it comes from who pays in the long run so I'm sorry Brad go ahead no, we know who pays middle and lower income Alaska families. We know who's leaving the state, uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, all right, on HJR seven, this is um, the proposal, the 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 current PFD proposal on the on the table. And I guess my concern is I'm not sure what it's going to resolve. the the the, the current proposal on the table now is to have a constitutional amendment that doesn't constitutionalize a PFD amount, it constitutionalizes setting the amount by statute. So, so whatever the statute says will, will have the benefit of having been constitutionalized and it will be recognized as constitutional, as a constitutional amount, as opposed to, as opposed to just a mere statutory amount that, that we've had. Um, but it's, but it's still going to be set by statute. So that means 21 plus 11 plus a governor can change it. It's probably good, you know, as long as Dunleavy's governor, because if the legislature tried to change the statute um, uh, by uh, by reducing what what's in the current statutory amount, the governor would likely veto that bill. But after governor, but after Dunleavy's gone, we don't know what we're going to get after that. We may get Walker, a Walker like, not Walker himself. I think he's done, but but a Walker like governor who will push the legislature to to decrease. Uh, the PFD down to you know a minimal amount, maybe maybe right in the statute is what's ever left over after after the amount's done, and all of a sudden that's going to be constitutionalized. I I understand why 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 the legisl why the why people are pushing that. I, I I get that the that you can't put the forces together to get a constitutionalized PFD amount now, I, and and this is sort of the best you can get, but I'm not sure what it's getting us. And I'm not sure, to me, I'm not sure spending a whole lot of energy pushing this through is gonna is, is, is the right way to spend our energy. To me, the right way to spend the energy is to continue to talk about the balanced, comprehensive approach and making a constitutionalized PFD amount part of that approach. Maybe you don't get it through this legislature. And I think that I think that's what the I think that's what Ben Carpenter's conclusion has been. So let's let's try to do something else. But but I'm not sure this fallback position 
of, of doing it by statute is going to get us. I mean, as I say, as long as Dunleavy's governor, maybe, maybe, you know, we're good, but Dunleavy's not going to be governor forever. And in the next legislature, it may be in, in the next governor, it may come back to come back to bite us. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to spend a whole lot of energy doing something. And in the end, in the end result, isn't going to be what we think it is. It's going to be something that, that, that not only doesn't advance the ball much, it, uh, it, it could come back to bite us. Well, and we still end up with two competing uh, statutes, right? We still end up with the POMV statute and the permanent fund, the original permanent fund statute. And it looks like apparently, uh, according to what just happened on last Thursday, we've been ignoring the Constitution anyway. So what's another constitutional, you know, it's ignoring another constitutional mandate uh, in the long run uh, on that. Uh, I mean, ideally, this would set, you know, ideally a PFD statute or a PFD change in the Constitution would enshrine something like the original formula in the Constitution. So there wouldn't be any there wouldn't be any question at that point. Right. Yep, exactly. I mean, 50 50 that the that the that the, uh, that the and this was Dunleavy's proposal. What one point that the permanent fund earnings will be split 50 50 in the Constitution done. We don't debate that anymore. That's the baseline. This sets up a sets up a situation where we keep debating it every year. You know, people say, well, let's let's amend let, let's amend the statute to re, to reduce it or let's amend the statute to do something else with it or let's you know, the the argument in the <laughs> the argument in House Judiciary was, well, it ensures that we at least get a dollar every year, that there is a PFD every year. That's a win. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, let, it, it let, 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 let's focus on the big picture and not and not look for the for, a, you know, the second best. Uh, theoretically, it does take it out of the appropriations process. But theoretically, I mean, at this point. Right. I mean, that's the that's the theory. Um, we're not sure that that's what it would actually happen. It may just continue to have this ball go back and forth. I mean, ideally, it does take it out of the appropriations process. But. I mean, I don't know if that's the practical, if that's what really happens. We're seeing that the legislature has very little, has very little uh, um, respect for law or the Constitution at this point, if they feel like it's not in the best interest of what's going on. Yeah. And there's, there's a couple of things, Michael. I mean, I, again, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not trying to cast a whole lot of, you know, adversity on on the proposal because ben is i think in good faith trying to you know do what he can but here's what it says each fiscal year without appropriation an amount determined by the formula set out in law shall be transferred from the earnings reserve account in the permanent fund to the general fund the amount transferred from the earnings reserve account shall not exceed the balance of the earnings reserve account each fiscal year with without appropriation the state shall according to the formula set out in law pay a dividend uh, to eligible residents of the state. That's 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 the guts of of what the of what the provision does. Well, two things about that. One, actually, the appropriations bill is a is a law. I mean, it's a statute. It says you know it, it, it is a statute in 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 all in all ways. It's a statute that appropriates, but it's nonetheless a statute. It sets out in law what this what the state uh, may spend. So I'm a little concerned that that. You know, the Supreme Court will say, yeah, OK, fine. The appropriation bill is a statute. What, what, what's the big deal? That's one. Two uh, is, I mean, I can easily see Burt <laughs> or Burt's successors uh, in the years ahead say, well, we're not going to consider this appropriation bill until we have a statute. And, and here the Finance Committee is going to propose a statutory change uh, that uh, that changes the PFD statute this year to X. Um, and we're going to enact the two together. And yeah, the governor might veto the appropriate, the, the, the change in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the PFD statute, but guess what? We'll put little tricks into the appropriation statute that it'll explode. Um, uh, if the governor does that and all sorts of bad things will happen. So we're going to tie the two together. So, and, then, so then the fight annually would be over the actual formula instead of over the statutory formula, instead of over the actual PFD amount, the annual fight would then be over changing the statutory formula every year. Yeah, exactly. And finance, you know, if it were Bird or his successor that runs it their way, uh, finance would just generate a finance bill that does it, doesn't go through any other process. Finance generates it, finance passes it, finance puts it on the floor, finance forces it through. 
and and it just becomes part of the sort of a sidebar to to the appropriations process instead of instead of it being a firm it shall be 50 percent of the of the permanent fund earnings in the constitution bam don't argue about it that's what the constitution says now let's go on to the next thing instead of it being that it'll be this annual okay what's our sidebar number this year how do, how do we how do we you know rewrite the statute this year to match what we're doing in the in the appropriations and i I can easily see Bert doing that or Bert's successor doing that. And it just, um, I, I just, it, we're not solving the issue. We're not solving the fundamental issue of what's the fair share of permanent fund earnings that goes to the citizens of Alaska. We're just kicking the can down the road in a different way. And, 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 you know, you know, putting different, a different process in place to, to re-kick the can uh, in future years. I, again, I'm not trying to say I'm not trying to say that what Ben's doing is is bad. I'm a big supporter of Ben. I hope he wins the race against Jesse Bjorkman. I, you know, all sorts of great things about Ben. But I'm just not sure what this particular approach is going to really do for us uh, down the road. Well, this is kind of a half measure, right? I mean, because the full measure that we're talking about, actually constitutionalizing the formula. Had zero, had zero support. I mean, the no, no, nobody in the legislature wanted to touch it. It was radioactive, and so this is the half measure to try and get us halfway there. But does it really fix the problem? I mean, I agree. I think that there are definitely some problematic issues with it. Um, but uh, as Donna points out, proposals like this have been put up, and they go nowhere. I mean, it's essentially the status quo. Yeah, my experience, my experience over the decades I've done this stuff is you sort of get one shot at doing something like this. You build up a bunch of energy, you build up a bunch of momentum, and you do it or not, but you sort of get one shot at doing it. And and I and I think my concern here is the PFD issue is going to continue to resonate. It's going to continue to be an issue. Do we want to spend all the momentum? Do we want to spend the energy? Is it a wise expenditure of that energy to to you know put it all behind this and to get this done? And then everybody can say, hey, we addressed the PFD issue. Finance, go do what you're going to do. But we we dealt with the PFD issue. It's now, you know, it's now in the Constitution. You guys won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Bert, go do what you're going to do. I mean, is it is it a wise use of, of the built-up energy to, to spend it on this bill? I wouldn't. If it were me, again, I'm not, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, say Ben's doing the wrong thing, but I wouldn't spend the energy this way, even though it wasn't going to do anything this year, I would still talk about a balance package uh, that that had as a piece of it, uh, you know, the spending cap, uh, uh, alternative revenues, and and fixing the PFD. I would spend this year continuing to build up support for that, in the hopes that in the next legislature it, it has it has more support and we go forward with it. Um, I don't think this provision is probably going to pass anyway. I think the Senate will trash it no matter what 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 form it comes through. Unless Bert figures out that he can manipulate it, and then he'll say, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that," uh, and then you know adopts it and co-ops it and turns it into his own little personal thing. Um, but I just I, I'm I'm not sure what we're accomplishing uh, with this bill. All right. Well, Brad, um, final thoughts. <laughs> my my final final thought is um, is is we've got a long way to go in this legislature. Uh, it's important to keep our eyes on the ball, uh, and and the ball is the numbers, the dollars, the dollars. Keep track yeah. of the dollars. Keep the spreadsheets going, and we'll keep talking about it in the weeks ahead. All right, Brad. Thank you so much, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We appreciate you, sir. We will talk to you again soon. Thanks, Michael. All right. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.